Hi friends, this is Joe, and this is the Dekahedron RPG Podcast. This is the fifth and final episode for OSR October for 2024, and this week's focus is on trade, like merchant trade uh, systems. And the information, as always, well, for this year, has been coming from the first fantasy campaign, which were Dave Arneson's notes on his Blackmore campaign that were published by Judges Guild in 1980. Um, the Blackboard campaign, if you didn't know, it was Dave Arneson's fantasy campaign that he was playing before Dungeons & Dragons. And he played a game for Gary Gygax, and Gary Gygax was like, wow, this is cool, we should publish this. So then he and Gygax worked together to make Dungeons & Dragons. So this is D&D before it was D&D, which I think is cool. So I have, for a while now, thought that it would be really nifty my wife hates it when I use words like that. <laughs> Thought it would be really nifty to run a fantasy campaign where the characters are merchants going from village to village, town to town, whatever, seeing what they can buy there and sell at the next place. And along the way, they run into adventures um, and stuff like that. Pretty much Traveler, but in a fantasy world, because Traveler did this beautifully with spaceships, but we're going to talk about that in a second. So it turns out that this brilliant idea I had, though, wasn't really brilliant at all because it's almost been done since the beginning of the hobby. Almost. There's some differences. Let's look at what Dave had to say. Dave starts off with, first, a few statistics. The average merchant ship can carry 150 tons, 350,000 pounds, of cargo in one trip. Being operated by a few dozen sailors, who should be paid regularly, and travel from 0 to 200 miles a day, with 100 miles a day being the average, it can unload at a rate of one ton of cargo an hour at most ports, and load at a similar rate. It can carry up to 40 horses, if it's specially constructed to do so, 150 men, maximum, with equipment, or 16 pieces of heavy equipment, catapults, wagons, etc. All right, there's more, but I'm going to stop there and talk about uh, what he said. So first of all, 0 to... Uh, 200 miles a day. So clearly that's a die roll. All right, that's cool. I like that he defines how much a ship can carry. That's cool. And uh, yeah, actually, I, I like everything about this paragraph so far. All right, let's look at the next one. A wagon is pulled by one or more horses, two for wagons, and can carry about 600 pounds of cargo. It can travel at five to 20 miles, 10 miles be the standard rate, a day along good roads. The horse eats, yes, they do eat grass, but not do heavy work all day too, 15 pounds of food a day, while a man eats about three pounds of food a day. So a wagon with a driver consume 18 pounds of food per day. All this comes from the wagon's carrying capacity. Food can be bought along the route at five gold pieces a week for the man and 15 gold pieces a week for the horse. Inns will sell them the required food within the limits of their stocks. Several wagons traveling together may run into problems, especially if the inn got burned down. So I like that he also includes an overland option, right? You, if you're not doing ships, you can do wagons. I like that. That's cool. Uh, 5 to 20 miles a day. That sounds like 5D4 to me. Okay. That's cool. Um, except, what about terrain? Um, and shouldn't it be like more of a set rate with uh, the train dealing the thing? Maybe this was just a real loosey-goosey way to hand wave it and say we are roughly 200 miles from there, so we're just going to do however many rolls and we're not going to worry about the exact route that it takes. Maybe. Um, that note that he says about the inn being burned down, that seems very specific. Uh, seems like a little haha, -ha, like inside joke about some story that actually happened during a game. Um, but yeah, overall, I'm, I'm digging this. I'm liking this. I'm seeing the, the basis of a good system here. All right, let's, let's keep going. Let's see what he says next. Trade goods are sold off the board at Capital City, which also happens to be along the coast. Although the rate of value differs greatly, see price list for some of the more expensive items. Even wood will sell at the other end. The usual return for a merchant on cargo is the neighborhood of 10 gold pieces per ton of cargo. 
the value to a bandit would be one to three times that rate roll die and he can sell it too. Now we're getting to some really specific things. It sounds like the only place you can sell your cargo is at Capital City, um, which is also making it sound like this is a little bit of a colony situation, right? You got your big capital and all the players, baronies and everything are just colonies for, for, the, baron, uh, for the, the capital and they're expected to set, send their goods there. All right, eh, not not bad. I, I could live with that. Um, but then there's that thing about, you know, the profit of about 10 gold pieces per ton, I think is what he said. That strikes me as weird because you could have 10 tons of grain or 10 tons of, 10 tons of wood, like he said, or 10 tons of gold. And no matter what, your profit is only about 10 gold pieces per ton. Um, I, 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 I don't know about that, question mark. Um, it seems to me the system I would like at least <laughs> would be a system where um, you have goods that you bought and then you go elsewhere and you sell them whatever you can get for them there. The other thing, I don't get that whole last part about one to three for a bandit and they can sell it to I really I do not know what he meant by that if you know please let me know comment below on YouTube or send me feedback I, I cannot figure it out it's like a random sentence that was shoved in there is he saying that bandits will pay more for goods that doesn't make sense bandits will take goods um I could see Bandit spying it for less. I, I, I don't, I really don't know what he's trying to say there. If, if you know, let me know. Uh, was there anything? No, I said everything I wanted to say about that one. All right, let's see what else he has to say. Goods must travel off the edge of the board in the direction where it is determined that the capital city lies or from outlying districts to the large city in the area. These goods are paid for at the starting price at the going rate and then transported to the capital for city at the retail rate, up to 40% higher than purchase prices. The money is then brought home or spent on items only available in the capital by whatever means are available. Now this I like, this makes sense. Now we're saying, okay, you can make up to a 40% profit, makes a little more sense. But then how does that fit into what he was just saying about the 10 gold piece thing in the previous one? I, it, this is the problem with all the early, <laughs> early stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't, if I got this and wanted to play this rules as written by the book, I have no idea what he's saying. I just don't pick one is what I would do. And I probably would go for the up to 40%, which sounds to me like, uh, I don't know, 1d4 times 10, or maybe it's 1d10 times four. I don't know, whatever floats your boat. Okay, I think he has one more paragraph. Let's take a look. Transport and guards can be hired from other players at whatever rate are agreed upon, or the judge can provide non-player transport that will consume half the normal profit margin. Players must always provide their own guards. Transport that is eliminated, 70% of the total is replaced en route. So let's start at the end. Uh, transport that is eliminated, 70% is replaced en route? Again, I don't know what he's saying. I'm thinking maybe this, he's saying guards that are eliminated, you can replace those because that's what he's talking about just before this. Um, but yeah, otherwise he's saying, you know, it needs to be guarded and stuff like that, which again is cool. Um, yeah, so that's his whole system. There's the basis for something cool there, but I don't like it as it is. So... After this, in 1977, Judge's Guild in issue K of uh, the Judge's K uh, the Judge's Guild Journal, um, initial guidelines K, had what they called the trade system. But all that was was when you go into a town, was determining how much of a demand there was for anything you were trying to sell. Um, yeah, let's take a look. 
Because most inhabitants are self-sufficient, trade is limited to towns or armies where specialization is evidenced. Since all village populations are stated in able-bodied men, the actual maximum market potential is roughly four times greater. Demand is the willingness to buy, not the ability to purchase. High prices demand wealthy customers. For example, wine, classified as a common good, sold in a village with a population of 200, 200 times 4 equals 800 people, and since wine sells for one gold piece at each, uh, would yield eight gold pieces. Okay, so just to get out of the way, one cool thing there is using the at sign for its original purpose of at each in the days before email stuff. That's kind of cool. But anyway, um, yeah, this actually reminds me of something that was in 3E. I think it was in the Dungeon Master's Guide for 3E, where it talked about like the maximum amount of gold they would, ha would have in the city to buy stuff, which I always found interesting. Um, but yeah, uh, so this is the selling side. It leaves out the whole buying side, right? This is, I guess, is assuming what you found in the dungeon, you're going to try to sell it. And this limits your market to be able to sell this stuff. Okay, that's okay. I wouldn't call that a trade system, though. That's just a complication to selling stuff. A trade system, again, I want people to buy something and then sell something. Uh, so I said that was from 1977. 1977 is also the year that Traveler came out. And Traveler had a wonderful, in my opinion, trade system. Uh, and it's too long for me to read, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But in, basically, when you went to a planet, you could roll to see if they had goods. And actually, they had freight, which is just people hiring you to carry stuff, or goods that you could buy, cargo they called it, that you could buy speculative cargo. You could buy it in hopes of selling it uh, somewhere else at a better price. I like that system. And because Traveler has uh, trade classifications for each planet, you know, then your agricultural goods are going to be cheaper at an agricultural planet. And when you go to an industrial planet, they'll pay more for them. It's good. It's a cool system. I like it. Later on, back around 1985, I think, uh, Traveler had its uh, fourth supplement. Fourth? Or actually, they just called it book, didn't they? And so it was book eight, I think. Uh, Merchant Prince. Mercenary, High Guard. Um, the Scout one. What was the Scout one called? Do you remember? Um, anyway, the Scout one, the Merchant Prince. So it was book eight. No, it was book seven, because there were only three core books, duh. All right. Um, maybe the Scout one was just called Scouts. I can't remember. <laughs> Let me know. Actually, I can look it up before you get to see this. Um, yeah, I, oh, so they came out with Merchant Prince. And in Merchant Prince, um, they made it too loosey-goosey. They made it, uh, you just pick up some goods and you don't know what they are. It's just, you pick up agricultural planet goods and you sell them at industrial planet. And then at industrial planet, you pick up industrial planet goods. And it's not saying that it's grains or fruits or anything like that. It's just, which I guess is easier for play to go along, but it's not as interesting roleplay wise, I don't think. Um, so any others I want to talk about? Uh, GURPS Traveler didn't have a system at all until they published GURPS Far Trader, which, um, as with many things in GURPS, I love the mechanics of GURPS. I think it's a, a very, it is the first game I played that had a core mechanic. I know a lot of people don't like core mechanics. I do. But GURPS was the first one I played with a core mechanic, and it was a very logical game, and I liked it rules-wise. However, <laughs> GURPS also heavily leans into reality, simulationism versus uh, storytelling or other stuff, um, <laughs> to the detriment of fun, I believe. For example, in the very first edition of GURPS, it said that karate did double damage. And for that reason, it was a physical hard skill versus the physical average skill of just fighting, uh, brawling, boxing, whatever. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's not very realistic, but it's a nice and easy way to do it because in GURPS, 
uh, impaling damage does twice the damage that uh, crushing damage, you know, a punch would do. So it's just a way to say that if you paid for karate instead of fighting, you would be doing double damage of what got through the armor. Nice, quick, easy. Later on, they uh, said, no, that's not realistic, and they changed it completely, and it involved decimal math and stuff, and it's... I get it. If you want to run a simulation of the game, yeah, that's get it. But for fun, they suck the fun out of things, and they did that with trade. And what they said in Merchant... Uh, merchant Print? No, they didn't call it Merchant Prints. They called it uh, Far Trader. What they did there was say, pretty much, you know... If you have all these planets and you have all these traders going hither and thither, if you start making this run and you're making a lot of money doing that, well, someone else is going to figure out and they're going to start doing it. And then uh, competition will kick in and it will drive the prices down to everyone's just barely making a profit. So they do away with all the other stuff and say, just assume you barely make money all, all, all the time, which, I don't know, takes the fun out of it. The other system I've seen was in the Rollmaster Standard System. Rollmaster, instead of having additions, they just name it every something different every time. And the standard system was one out in the 90s. Anyway, uh, and uh, they have a book. It's called The book is called And a Ten Foot Pole, which I love the book. It's a price list for like every time period. It's great. And in the front of that, they had this simple little trade system, but it is not simple enough for me. So, how would I do this? Well, I have a blog post about this that I wrote in 2020, I think, maybe 2021, somewhere around there. I will put a link in the show notes or down below because the problem with the Traveler Way is that it requires you to know that this is an agricultural village or this, right? You have to do a whole lot more work when you're generating your villages and stuff. And I would do it in reverse which is I would determine what goods the village has in excess and what goods they have that are in demand. And then I would take those pieces, hey, they have shellfish in excess and they're in demand of wood. All right, that tells me something about that village, right? They have very little trees. They're on at least a river, if not a lake or uh, ocean. And uh, yeah, maybe they used all the wood to like build bridges or boats or whatever. And uh, now they need to import wood, whatever. It's a basis to come up with, with the rest of the story. <laughs> and anyway, so if they have excess, anything you buy there, you're going to buy at a discount. If they're in need, you're going to be able to sell it at higher than average prices. And it's in the middle, you're going to pay or get normal prices for it. So a very simple system. I have a long list of the items I would do. That's what I would do. If you know of another system, let me know. I like looking at other systems. Um, and like I said, if you want to know more about my system, check out the blog post uh, from a few years ago. Anyway, that's all I have. It was about trade systems. When I saw it in First Fantasy Campaign, I was like, yep, that's what I want to talk about because it's, like I said, I've always wanted to do that kind of campaign. What do you think of that kind of campaign, by the way? Do you, would you enjoy that? I think it could be fun, but maybe that's just me. Yeah, I could just I could just see it going from village to village with with your wagon full of goods or whatever, having to hire guards, having to oh, we found a buyer, but they want us to do this first or whatever. Anyway, let me know. Thanks for watching and or listening. Feel free to send me feedback. All the ways to do it are on the screen right now if you're on YouTube or if you're in the podcast. Well, you wouldn't be in the podcast if you're listening to the podcast. Uh, they're in the show notes. Uh, the short version is feedback at decahedron.com, spelled decahedron with a K. Anyway, again, thanks for listening and or watching. And until next time, happy gaming, happy life. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Decahedron RPG Podcast. Please come back again to the Dickie Hedron RPG Park.